Number 275, am I a soldier of the cross? Number 275. No. Am I a soldier of the cross, a follower of the Lamb? And shall I fear to own His cause, or blush to speak His name? Must I be carried to the skies? On flowery beds of ease, while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. Are there no foes for me to face? Must I not stim the my courage, Lord. I'll bear the toil, endure the pain, supported by thy word. I'm going to go ahead and begin this evening. Great for us to be here with one another and to worship our God with one another and to um, be here singing with one another and praying with one another. Thank you for your presence here tonight as a family we've gathered here. But we're always blessed with visitors. We have a number of people from other congregations. Thank you for your interest in God's Word as well and the faithfulness that you show and you share with us this evening. For any who may be from the uh, community who are here tonight with us, thank you for your presence. Come back anytime you have an opportunity. We'd love to, for you to come back some more. And if you fill out a visitor card on the back of the pew in front of you, that would be something we would very much appreciate. Thanks for being here. We're here to worship God tonight. We're here to encourage one another. Our brother Scott Smelzer from Philadelphia, well, from uh, Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, is here with us this week. He has preached two wonderful lessons yesterday on the issue of strengthening the home. This morning he preached on the parables, and we had a wonderful lesson then, there this morning looking at the Good Samaritan. So um, I know tonight we're going to be blessed as we talk about the idea of raising children, and I hope everyone will listen closely as the Word of God is taught. If you have any question afterwards, and then uh, you can see him, see someone here. We'd be more than happy to sit down with you and study with you, do anything we can to encourage you and help you along the road. So thanks for being here tonight at this time. My brother Ron Morris, who is from the Old and Woods congregation, is going to lead us in a word of prayer. We'll have several more songs before getting into the lesson for this evening. So let's get ready to go to God again and worship to him in prayer. Let's all pray together. Our holy and almighty, righteous Father in heaven, hallowed be thy great and powerful name, Father. We praise you as the creator of the universe, the author of the great plan of salvation that was determined before the creation of this world, that you would send your son to this earth to die on the cross, shed his blood for our sins. Dear Father, we're thankful for that sacrifice. We're thankful for that precious blood that's Power beyond measure. We're thankful, Father, for your long suffering for us, and that you would think of us, and that we can be your children as obedient followers of you. Dear Lord, we're thankful for that plan. We're thankful for that precious and perfect sacrifice. Dear Father, we ask your blessings upon this congregation this week during the meeting. As Brother Smeltzer 
opens up the book of life and presents practical lessons that we all need to know and to learn and to pass on and to show others your great and awesome plan that you had for husbands and wives, the blessing of children that we have. And we pray, Father, that each and every one of us are not only salt and lights in our community, but we are also light to our families and light to our children, and that we teach them your precepts and that we pass those things on as we should so that they too can be raised understanding your great power and their need to have you as a Savior. We ask your blessing to be upon our children. We ask your blessing to be upon everyone in this congregation. Dear Father, we also pray for your continued comfort and healing on those that are sick, those that are physically sick, and we ask, Father, that the hearts of those that are spiritually sick might be softened, that they might understand the need that they have be able to return to you. Thank you, Father, for your grace, and thank you, Father, for your great love. And thank you, Father, for your Son, Jesus Christ, once again was the precious sinless lamb that take away the sin of this world. Thankful for him, resurrection, his power in which he is enthroned at your right hand. In all things, Father, in his name we're thankful. Amen. Last night, our songs focused on the worthiness of our God to be worshipped and praised. If that's the case, then he's certainly worthy of our devotion and our loyalty. And that's the theme that we will explore in our songs this evening. Sing three songs, and then we will have the lesson this evening and sing one additional song at the conclusion of the lesson. If you want to go ahead and make note of the song after the lesson, it'll be number 335. That's live for Jesus. This time we'll sing number 138, Prince of Peace, Control My Will. Oh me, Prince of Peace, Control My Will, Be Now. 
number 124, Nearer My God to Thee, number 124. Nearer my God to Thee, nearer to Thee, e'en though it be a cross that raiseth me. Still Please stand with me and we'll sing number 415, To Christ Be True. Sing all four verses of this song and then we will open the Word of God together this evening. Number 415. Christ be loyal and be true, his banner be unfurled, and borne aloft till it secure the conquest of the world. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you.
loyal and be true in noble service group. Your faith and your fidelity, the fervor of your love to Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you all your conflicts through to Christ the Lord be true. To Christ be loyal and be true and he will be your friend, defending and protecting you to life's triumphant end. To Christ the Lord be true, for he will go with you and help you To Christ the Lord be true. Please be seated. We appreciate your presence this evening. I appreciate the opportunity to be here with you and the invitation to come down and talk about this subject. As the brother led us in the prayer a few moments ago, he spoke about the blessing that children are, and they so surely are. My wife and I were blessed with three boys and three girls. And just before coming here, my baby girl had a baby girl. Um, my daughter, Brianne, the second of my three daughters, uh, married my coworker in the gospel uh, last spring, uh, 14, and, and this year they had their first child, and she was born Saturday night, and I got to see her just before I headed out here. And for those of you who have seen children come into the world, you know what a amazing blessing that is. And they are entrusted to us. And those of us who have been parents know that we were not the perfect parents and we have made mistakes with our kids. I have, you have. It's, uh, it's kind of ironic that when we're still quite young and inexperienced, we get, you know, we have children and God's made them also surprisingly resilient. It's kind of like you don't ever want them to fall down the stairs, and then one day one of them tumbles down the stairs, and you're, oh, and then he's usually okay. Uh, but we don't want to keep making the same mistakes. You know, we don't want to, if we realize why they tumbled down the stairs, we don't want to keep doing that. And so starting tomorrow night, we're going to be talking about avoiding parenting pitfalls, the type of mistakes that it's so easy for us to fall into and how to avoid those. Tonight, we're going to be talking about early child training. And I'll, I'll say just a little bit uh, about my background on this topic before getting started. Um, most of you do not know me and do not know my children. Uh, my children, I think, by and large, are better people than me. Uh, they have been resilient and not repeated all the mistakes that I've made in life, but they are, um, it, it's perhaps one of the reasons why I've ended up over the years doing this series a lot. But the first time I ever was asked to speak on this general topic, I was 21 years old and single and asked to go over to this other church and teach on the family in child training, so I rode my motorcycle over there, and I taught, and I said a lot of the things then, the type of things then that we're going to be saying in the next few nights, because I based the teaching on the book of Proverbs. Now, I want to encourage you young people, 
Those of you that haven't married yet, those of you that are about to get married, those of you that are, haven't had children, those of you that have young children, look at the book of Proverbs. And you will sometimes have people tell you, oh, you don't know what you think you'll be able to, you don't know what it's like. Listen to Scripture. Follow Scripture and watch those principles work. They're valuable principles, and we will be looking at them. First off, there's this, which is a truism. It's a generally true statement. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6, and it says this. Train up a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. We'll talk later in the week about the importance of that word train. It doesn't just say control your child. You need to control your child. That's not at all what this is limited to. This is about training a child in the way that he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, much of the book of Proverbs is stated in general statements or truisms. It's not that every statement in Proverbs you can never find an exception to in any way. Because you can. For example, look at Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. It says here, A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. Now, if we'll just think about our experience, and when people are angry or when we've been angry, what generally happens when we start using harsh words in an argument? Does that usually calm things down? No, it doesn't. What does it do? It stirs up wrath. And then when somebody gives a gentle answer, what does it do? It calms things down. Is that going to be the case 100% of the time? No, you can, you can have an angry drunk, and you may say something gentle to him, and it doesn't mean that it's necessarily going to calm him down. You can find someone where maybe it's an exception to the rule. Proverbs says, the hand of the diligent, you know, will, will, uh, that it will prosper, he'll stand before kings, that type of thing. Well, if you are slave 132 on a plantation by uh, a man that doesn't care anything about you, it may not. But these things are generally so. And if we will do with what is generally so, we will so often find the results. We will still have, and they will stay, still have free will. Our children will grow up. They will have to make decisions. We will have to make decisions. But we want to give them the training that's important. And I'll tell you this. By and large, especially with a younger child, you get what you expect. Expectations are a huge, huge part of parenting. If you expect tantrums, you will get them. Like, have you ever talked to a parent and their child's lying, and what's their reaction? They say, well, children are going to lie. The child is sassing their mother, and they'll say, well, children are going to do like that. Well, she's two. Well, she's four. Well, he's six. Well, he's five. You know what that parent is asking? They're asking for the misbehavior because they're expecting it, and that is what they're going to get. If you expect tantrums, you will get them. If you expect dishonesty, you will get it. If you expect bad attitudes, you will get it. But if you really expect the opposite and require and train for the opposite, you will get the opposite. Let me give an example that I'm in the middle with right now with uh, my kids. Three of them are still at home. We had uh, six children all four years apart. So the age range is like 31 to 11. And one thing I'm trying to work on right now with the boys is to keep the room clean. And it has not been clean because I haven't expected it. Okay? So whose fault is that? That will be my fault. Now, I'm not a terribly neat person. If you look in my car right now, you will see 
still, you know, a Kentucky Fried Chicken box and some things from the drive over. Uh, if your car is spotless, I, I admire that. I celebrate that. Mine is not. Um, we live in a house built in 1897 and living in it with six kids. It had only two closets in it. Uh, my wife homeschools. So you can imagine it, it's not all, if you come in, it doesn't always look like, you know, the houses in the magazines. But I have noticed I go in my boy's room and it's just a mess. And if I just say, I wish you guys would do better on this, what's going to change? Nothing. So I explained to them a couple of weeks ago. I said, if I go in your room and it's a mess, you're not going to bed until it's clean. And if you're asleep and it's the middle of the night, I'm going to wake you up and you're going to get up and you're going to clean your room and, it's going, and then you can go to bed. And so we've been having a cleaner room. But if I don't go in the room and check, that's not going to stick, is it? What if for the next three weeks, I go in there every single day, check the room every single day, and they don't go to bed until it's clean? What's going to happen? That room is going to be clean every day. But if I forget about it, if I don't expect it, what's going to happen? The habit that I allowed to exist before is going to keep happening. It's about whether or not we expect it or not. Now, if I just say, I kind of wish their room was cleaner, that's not the same thing as expecting it. So if you expect your children to say, yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, what will they say? They'll do that. Now, if you just think that would be nice, but you don't expect it, so you don't correct it when they don't, and that, that type of thing, that's not going to happen. And if that's not important to you, that's not going to happen. Let me illustrate it this way. If you are, you remember the old type of drill sergeant at Paris Island? When the new recruits get off the bus, does he expect them to learn how to do military push-ups and make a bed to military specifications and march according to military specifications? Is that what he expects out of them? Yes, it is. Does he think that they're already doing that right now? No, he doesn't think that at all. But why are they going to be doing it by the time they leave there? Because he expects that they will. Proverbs 29, verse 15 says, The rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. You've seen, if you've been to Walmart, you've seen this type of child. Um, I'll, I'll relate two instances. One, which I saw myself, one, which I thought was an apocryphal tale until uh, somebody had told it to me and I repeated it. I thought it was one of those stories that make a point. So I said, I don't think it was really true. Sarah Bain Bunning happened to be in the audience and she said, it's true. My husband was the one that saw it. <laughs> she described the, the, where it was and when it was and everything else. First one, this is a four-year-old boy. Now, four years old is like my favorite age. A four-year-old should just be a delight to be around. I used to live near a four-year-old boy, and it just wasn't. And it's sad to say, I, I really love children, but I will tell you, and this kind of hurts to say it, I did not like this child. And that just sounds horrible to say, a four-year-old. How can you not like a four-year-old? Well, I'll tell you how. Apparently, his mother, who should have known better, was a Bible believer, had read some books on child psychology and parenting and bought into the idea not to discipline her child, not to spank him, not to give him much discipline or anything. And so, she didn't. And they would be over here, and they would be calling for him. I'll change the name to protect the guilty. William! William! William, get over here! And I look over there, and there's William, and he's just totally ignoring his mom. After a little while, 
Dad starts calling him. William! William, get over here! He totally ignores. After a while, the mom yells. Totally ignores. This just goes on. Eventually, William is trotting along in front of me with his little friend. And I said, William, I said, why didn't you go when your mom and dad called you? He goes, I didn't hear him. And his little friend said, yes, you did. This is the same boy. I open up my car door, and there's just a pile of dirt. Just a pile of dirt he's just put in my car. Another day, he opens my door, doesn't knock, doesn't ring the doorbell, opens the door. The front of his overalls are soaked. The back of his overalls are brown. And he goes, I don't have to use the bathroom. Now you understand, he was not a likable child. And it wasn't his fault. By this point in time, today, he's a grown man. I don't know where he is. I don't know what he's doing. But now he's responsible for himself. But at age four, you know whose fault that was completely? Parents' refusal to train. The story that uh, I was going to relate, the, the, the other one that uh, Sarah Bain told me, yeah, my husband saw that. He was staying, uh, Brother Bunting was staying with somebody in a meeting down in Florida. And they have fixed some eggs for the child in the high chair. And she goes, I don't want it. The parent said, what do you want? I want a worm. This foolish parent went outside. And the house, she said it was all nicely decorated, designer stuff, you know, custom interior decorating. None of the Drapes were in their proper place. It had all been pulled down by the child. This parent went outside and dug up a worm. Came back in, gave the child the worm. The child said, I want it cooked. Well, this was in the days before microwave, so they got out the cast iron skillet, and they fried the worm. They gave the child the worm. The child said, I want you to cut it in half. They cut it in half. He said, I want you to eat half of it. parent, it's hard to tell who's the adult here, <laughs> but the person chronologically older ate half of the worm. And then the child, it was a child's turn, the child, same thing with the eggs, didn't want it. Just foolish, foolish, foolish. And if you tell some people that you discipline your children or you spank your children, you require them to obey, you will have some people act like, oh, that is child abuse. No, what I just described is really abusive to the child because you are denying them the God-given opportunity to be trained. They're given to adults to train them. It is not our job to ignore that. Parents, the Bible says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he's old, he will not depart from it. Judith Harris wrote a book a number of years ago now, and it was on the nature-nurture debate. And the question the book asked was, do parents really matter? It was reviewed uh, This is back in the 90s uh, by... It was, I think, maybe the Newsweek science writer. And fortunately, she was not too impressed with the book. I was glad. Uh, but as it described the book, it told Judith Harris's approach to this. Her idea was that, parents, you don't matter. She said, your children are going to be who they're going to be based on two factors, and that's pretty much it. Their DNA and their peers. That's going to determine who they're going to be, and you just don't matter. Doesn't make any difference which you are, which you do. DNA and their peers are going to determine it. Now, he did say there are some things you can do. You know what you can do? She said, because peers matter, you want to make enough money to live in the best neighborhood so that they can associate with an upper class of peers. And 
because looks matter, you need to be accepted by their peers. You need to make enough money to make sure that they're dressed in the latest styles so that they'll be accepted by their peers and be ready to pay for orthodontia and possibly plastic surgery if needed. So they'll be accepted, you know, and approved of by their peers. And I got to thinking about that. And on the one hand, I think she's totally, totally wrong. And on the other hand, I think she is partially right. If you do not spend time training your children, if you do not raise your children, if as soon as the child is born, you put it in a daycare center, if we're all so busy making money that we're not actually training or raising our children, if we're letting the government, if we're letting everybody else, anybody else supervise our children and we have very, very, very little time with them so that I think I heard one time that the average time a father in Britain spent with his teenage son was 15 minutes a week. If that's your interaction with your child, guess what? That's right, you're not going to matter. You're not, you're not involved. You're not involved in their life. On the other hand, if you're involved in your child's life, you will make a difference. Let's give a few examples. One, I imagine a number of you made a garden this spring. Uh, first time I ever started to do a garden, I went out and I dug up all the ground by hand. Uh, this is why I was still single um, and didn't follow through on it. But I dug it all up and then I went and I got, there was some chicken uh, uh, barns nearby. I went and got some and fertilized my ground and got it all ready. And I never bothered to plant any good plants. But I tell you what, I had some fine tall weeds. I mean, it was, it was like a jungle right there. But if you invested time in your garden, what did you find happened? If you planted the seeds and you watered them and you weeded it, and you took care of it, if you checked the soil to see what maybe it needed or it didn't need, what did you get at the end of the, at the at harvest time? Got a nice crop. Now, if I'm living next door, and I've got my big weeds over here, and then I look over there at that, and I say to you, oh, you're so lucky you had easy vegetables. That's not why you had the good crop, right? Why did you have a good crop? Because you were putting the time into it that you need to. You remember yesterday, I think I mentioned about these cats that had kittens at our house last year. You've seen a cat have kittens. You've seen a bird in your yard uh, lay eggs, and then there's these little bitty birds, and then soon they fly away. How long does it take between the time a bird is hatched to the time that that bird is completely on its own and doesn't need its parents? Almost no time at all, right? I mean, it's just, they've got no feathers, they're kind of fuzzy, mom's feeding it a worm, and then they get some feathers, and mom gets it to fly out of the nest, and off it goes, and boom! It's on its own, in a matter of weeks. A kitten. How long before that kitten can be on its own? Human beings. That little baby. Moms, if there's somebody here with a newborn, how long is it going to be before that little guy or that little girl is able to be on their own? A few weeks and she's just out on her own, right? Oh, maybe a couple or four months, right? A year? We're more complicated than a bird or a cat. And God has given us more Time. There's more that we need to learn. We need to know more than this or how to eat a worm. And God has given us a great amount of time, and we want to use that time well. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7.
Starting in verse 6, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your sons. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 4. We mentioned these passages yesterday. We want to read them one more time here today. Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but nurture them in the chastening and admonition of the Lord. And when we are doing that, and we need to start it early, when we are doing that, you are not being selfish when you teach your child to obey you. You're doing that child a great, 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 great father, but favor, because you are preparing that child to obey a greater father than you or I are. If I train my children and you train your children to try to get around what we say, ignore what we say, and not take seriously what we say, then what habits are going to develop in the character of that child? And have you ever seen adults who have that same type of habit in responding to what God says? You see people that try to get around what God says, ignore what God says, not listen to what God says. When a person learns as a young child to deny self, to submit and obey their earthly father and mother, it prepares their heart to be humble before a much, much greater father. Don't feel guilty when you're getting your child to obey. And if somebody else says, oh, let him do that, oh, let her, don't feel guilty. You're doing your responsibility, and you're doing your child a great favor. Early training in the word no. When you have a little child, what are some of the first words that he learns or she learns? Mama? Daddy, and no. One of the first things that they learn, right? And they will not understand at that age why it's no. You know, if they're sticking a paper clip in the electrical outlet, you know, don't try to have a discussion with them about electrical currents and that type of thing and, and you know, hope that, the, that this little bitty child understands all that. They don't understand all of that, but they need to learn what? No. And if you will train your child no, respect no, you have done a lot of the parenting already. After that, it will be fine-tuning and adjusting and further educating. But when you get them to learn, when they're told no, it is no, a lot of your work is already done. And you can do that at a very young age. I want you to think about, in the Bible, Adam and Eve and the children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Now, when Adam and Eve were created, how old were they chronologically? Well, Adam was brand new, and then Eve was brand new. I believe they're physically fully formed. How much wisdom do they have? How much emotional maturity do they have of years of experience? They don't. And God started off with a rule. And do you remember what that rule was? There was a no-no. Adam and Eve, you can, or a Adam, we had been told, and then reported to Adam, you can eat any of these, but this one right here, no, no. Thou shalt not. And what does Eve do? Unlike a four-year-old, <laughs> you know, it's, she's, she's an adult, but she does the behavior of a small child that you say, you can have anything you want, just nothing in that cookie jar. <laughs> you know, it's, and she breaks that rule. And then there was what? Consequences. It's not, don't make me tell you again. It's not, I'm going to count to three. There were consequences. Children of Israel coming out of Egypt. Were these a spiritually mature people or a spiritually immature people? Spiritually immature people, we can see by their behavior. 
And what did God tell them? The Ten Commandments, now there were greater laws than the Ten Commandments. We know that because when Jesus was asked what was the greatest law, he didn't quote one of the Ten Commandments. He quoted, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the other things hang from that. But a lot of the Ten Commandments are no-no's. Now, I want you to compare it to, uh, say, if you're in charge of all the three- and four-year-olds here, and everybody, and you got some good kids here, so I imagine they'd be well-behaved. But let's just say it's not only these three- and four-year-olds, but just all the three- or four-year-olds in the neighborhood. And a bunch of people are going to go somewhere, and you're going to follow them. And they say, well, you know, remind them to keep some rules. And you say, oh, we're not going to need any rules. I'm just going to explain to the children that we'll just be polite and kind and respectful, and that'll take care of it. It's not going to work. You know, because you're going to need some rules. You can sit there and tell all the children, let's be kind and polite and respectful. In a few minutes, you're going to be needing to say things like, no, no, on the kicking. <laughs> you know, no, no, on the hitting. No, no, on the hair pulling. It's good to when we later understand the bigger picture, but you're going to have to start with some of those. And you look at the Ten Commandments, you have pro probably for a large part illiterate, immature, unspiritual people that are going to be whining and complaining and groaning and not able to look past the end of their nose and rebelling against God. And a lot of the Ten Commandments, you know what they are? No, no on the killing. No, no on the stealing. No, no on the taking somebody's wife. No, no on the coveting. It's a lot of no's. We need that in training. And when you tell your child, when they're reaching for something glass that might break, for a sharp knife, when they're over at grandma's and they're about to pull down the teacups, when they're about to, to do it, some people have the idea, oh, we need to child-proof the room. No, world-proof the child, okay? One mom, she decided, I'm not going to take down all the teacups. I'm going to teach her not to touch them. And so if she touched the teacups, she got a spanking. So the little girl got a pencil. Tried to touch it, got another spanking. <laughs> it's, you know, children will try, but you got to learn the way it goes. If you do that, there might, you need to teach a respect and a compliance for the prohibitory no. Now, here's what a lot of parents do. No, I, I remember hearing one mom do this. Uh, the child, he was maybe 12, 13, he's reaching for something. She's saying, no, no, don't get that. No, no, don't touch that. No, I said no, don't, no, don't. And he went ahead and did it. She said, oh, I'm going to get him a hearing aid. That wasn't the problem. When the child defiantly disobeys the first no, there should be consequences. He needs to get a spanking. Don't spank the child because he spilled his milk. But there needs to be consequences. We're going to see there's going to be a number of verses about uh, uh, disciplining children here in the book of Proverbs as we're going to be going on. But when, I remember one time there was this mom, she would call me up, she kept thinking there was something wrong with this one child. You know, but he just... He just, there must be something wrong with him. Listen, I'm trying to get him to, to do his homework. Listen how he's acting. And she was just always like, he's bad. He's... One time I was over there, and we're having a Bible study, and he said, his mom told him, go downstairs. He actually went, but as he went, he did this. He went, no. And then in a few minutes, she's whining and saying, I don't understand why he doesn't, why he doesn't obey me better and everything. And she didn't know I'd heard that. And I said, well, it's kind of like a while ago when he told you no and you didn't do anything about it. I said, you heard that? I said, yeah. You see, the thing is, no is a powerful word. And when mom and dad say no in a prohibitory sense, junior needs to understand that's no. Let your yay be yay and your no be no. But pretty soon, junior learns that that word's pretty powerful. So he's going to try it on mom and dad. So it's like, Junior, pick up your toys. No. <laughs> and Junior should do that a maximum of one time. And no more. At this point, it's not, no, no, Junior, we don't tell mommy no. No. 
he needs to learn that he has violated a fundamental thing. And this is serious, serious business. And mom, learn to have, you know, the not angry face, not, you know, belligerent face, but the, oh, you know, this is serious face. And you told mommy, no, this is serious. He needs to have a lecture and he needs to be spanked in a way that he will not forget about it and he will never do that again. If you just allow it and allow it, he's going to keep saying no, he's going to keep ignoring your no. There needs to be a zero tolerance for the defiant and rebellious no and respect and compliance for the prohibitory no. And if you don't mean it, don't say it. If you do mean it, enforce it. Jesus said, let your yea be yea and your nay be nay. Uh, I had a friend in high school, and his mom said no a lot. Now, now, and he had no respect for his mom. One time he said, and this is just sad, he said to me, the only reason I don't just slap my mother is because I know what would happen when my dad got home. Now this out of a 15 or 16 year old. Isn't that sad? Think back to the day that that mother gave birth to that little boy. And now he just wishes he could slap her in the face. Well, one reason why was because she was so quick with her no, but they wouldn't stick. You know, it doesn't mean you're a good parent because how many times you say no. You know, Dad, can I play in the street? No. Can I stick a fork in the electric outlet? No. Can I have fun? No. Can I breathe in and out? No. That doesn't make you a good parent. You don't say no to everything. Kids need to have fun. Being a child should be a lot of fun. It should also involve responsibility and obedience and training. But man, it is a wonderful time to have fun. Parents need to have fun with their kids. They need to have fun with their brothers and sisters. Everything doesn't need to be no. There needs to be a lot of yes. There needs to be some special things. There needs to be some fun things. But when it is no, let it be no. I remember one time she'd say, no. No, and he'd, he'd argue with her, no, you're, no, you're not, no, this. And she'd give arguments, and he'd whittle her down, and then eventually she'd say, well, how long you be long? gone? And then he gets to go. It just builds annoyance and irritation. Now, there may be some time when you've said no, and then later you find out some extra information, and you say, okay, I didn't realize that first. You know, that'd be fine. But that's different where it's a standard behavior of where it says, no, no, come on, I want wine, 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 until you manipulate your way through it. Don't let it be that way. This is training them to obey God later. And again, what do we want? Do we want this harvest or do we want this harvest? You want to avoid an upside-down home. We talked last night about moms, if you're going to go out and the realtor show you a house to raise your family in, if they say, yeah, I got one right here, you might say, yeah, I'd like to take a look at that one. But if you pull up at the house and they say, how about this one? Anybody want to live in that house? Got hardwood floors, granite countertops, and get you a good price on it. No, you don't want that house. Why? It's upside down. I'm going to tell you something. If Louisville, Kentucky is like most cities in the United States of America, there's a whole bunch of people living in upside down homes. Remember the parent and the kid and the worm? Who was in control of that house? Wasn't the parent in control, who was in control? The child was in control and not to the child's benefit. Somebody I think wrote this, I don't think I originally wrote all this, it might have been uh, Michael Pearl who's written some child training stuff or maybe partially barred from him, I don't even remember now, but it makes a point. Too many children view the home, the parents, the food, etc., as merely a means to an end, to satisfy and please the child. So you go to grandma's, great, because she's going to give me a cookie. You know, you go over here, great, I want this, I want that, and everything is supposed to revolve around the child. Some moms treat their child like he's the center of the universe. You are not doing him a favor. Because the rest of the world is not going to agree to that. His boss is not going to be on the same page. 
The state troopers are not going to be on the same page. The women that he meets are not going to be on the same page. And so if you treat him like he's the center of the universe, you're doing him a disfavor. Treat him to see his place in the universe, which is what? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. And get rid of that selfishness. See ourselves where we need to be. Guess what? Now he'll be a good worker for his boss. Now he'll be someone that other people will be able to relate to. But if you create a situation where the child just thinks everything is just to satisfy and please him, the child makes his demands, manipulates the parents by tantrums and repeated misbehavior. Parents bow to the will of the child in efforts to placate and appease his whims and dissatisfactions or suffer through increased strife and conflict when they cannot. The home is like a house built upside down. The child needs to understand it is not child first, then parents, and then God at the bottom. No, it is God first, then dad and mom, and he's to obey. And he will grow up, and then he can leave father and mother and cleave to his wife. And if they are blessed with a little bundle of joy, it'll be their job to teach him to obey no, and to train him, and to teach him away from unselfishness and rebellion so that he will listen to authority and he will be a happier camper. And he will grow up to be Someone who has been trained to not just put self first. That's not what children need. And we need to not train them in that way. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will what? Serve the Lord. The husband is the head of the house that the wife is to follow and submit to. He is to honor the wife. She is, in 1 Timothy 5, to rule the household, the children, are to obey their parents. And then when their parents are older and their grandparents are older in 1 Timothy 5, they're to care for and see to them. And the cycle continues. And children come into this world. The beautiful system God has designed. We'll be talking over the next two or three nights about more specifics in child raising and parenting. Thank you for your attention this evening. Let's sing the song selected. Yeah. <laughs>
Miss tonight, we'd like to invite everyone to come back tomorrow night. Remind everyone, before you leave tonight, please turn your cell phone off or the ringer. That was mine, by the way. That was going off a minute ago. I do hate, you know, things like that happen, and we'll try to make an announcement tomorrow night to tell everyone to turn it off, and I'll try to turn mine off. I do hate that it came at that moment, because that was such an important moment for children to recognize that they are not the center of the house. And uh, I hope that you got the message despite the distraction there because there are so many kids who don't get that message. So many parents who don't. Right? Teresa and I, when we were in Starkville, I remember a really nice couple. They weren't Christians. But uh, the lady quit her job at a university. Her husband was the head of the department. They weren't believers at all. And she sacrificed a lot for her, her kids. But when you walked into that house, it was apparent that the kids were the center of the house. And uh, God needs to be the center. Um, not going to start out in the world, everybody. It has to start with us. For those of you who are going through the process of raising kids, I cannot say amen enough to the things that were said tonight. The scriptures that were said. Our children are not guinea pigs. They're not disposable, as we talked about yesterday. We are raising children to stand before God one day. God bless you. God bless all of us as we seek to do what we can to raise them so they'll stand before God, ready to go to heaven one day. Is that what we want? Amen? All right. Thank you, Scott, so much for the lesson tonight. Tomorrow night, we'll gather again at 7.30. Then tomorrow morning, not then, actually then first, Tomorrow morning at 11.30, we'll gather and we'll continue to study about the parables. Then tomorrow night at 7.30, and then every night this week. Thanks for being here tonight. Again, thanks for the, our visitors, but for our members. Uh, these are busy weeks for everybody, I know. And by the end of the week, you're going to be worn out, but it's going to be a good worn out. There's so much we're going to learn. And I hope you realize, too, that there are so many applications even outside of the home. Interpersonal applications within churches. That you can sit back and go, well, you know, I'm not married, I don't have any kids, but you still learn something that you can apply, whether you're in that situation or not. So uh, let's be excited about coming back again tomorrow night. Uh, very quickly, for our members, Sister Ora Wilson came through her surgery.